Okay, my name's Corey Quinn, and I'm a failure. <laughs> Professionally, I'm a consultant that helps companies deal with their horrifying AWS bills. But enough about that. Uh, <laughs> even though I refer to myself as a failure, other people call me a lot of other things instead. Most of those terms run afoul of this conference's code of conduct, but one that doesn't is thought leader. <laughs> now, what is a thought leader? It's a great question. That's the kind of question a thought leader would ask, <laughs> which is really how I wound up here in the first place. Something that I found is that when you ask a stupid question, and yes, they do exist, that other people are thinking the same thing, but they have a sense of pride or shame that prohibits them from saying the really dumb thing. And I found that I'm usually the person that's dumb enough to ask the stupid question publicly. People start to respond positively to that, and then they call you thought leader, or in my case, at least, assistant regional thought manager. <laughs> and I've got a few failures that I wanted to talk to you about today. And these are times that I've failed. And the point I want to make is that I'm up here giving this talk uh, not necessarily in spite of all these failures, but because of them. But it didn't feel like that at the time. And the three failures that I want to talk about today carry a tremendous amount of stigma with them. That's not to be confused with stigmata, which is something else entirely. This is the least offensive... Oh... Hey, now we have the live demo portion. <laughs> right, right? <laughs> and we're back. Right. Again, computers are hard. Okay, yeah, you only typo the word stigma once into Google Images before you find that you're not able to sleep anymore. This is the least offensive picture that I could find for that. So I have three failures that even now still hurt to some extent to talk about. So please withhold your judgment of me, uh, silent or out loud, until the end. Uh, growing up, college was always described as success. It was never a question of what, wh whether or not I would go to college, it was just something that was taken for granted. And it was more or less, where would I go and what would I study? So my problem is, is that I was a terrible student. So that was sort of, I was beaten up for that uh, verbally for most of my life. And at the end of it, I turned 18 and I had two options. I could go to college or I could try and make it on my own and good luck not killing myself with a deep fat fryer because I was somewhat accident prone. So. At this point, I have a huge question to wrestle with and figure it out. What am I studying? And funny things happen when you wind up asking 18-year-olds to make important life choices that are going to dictate the rest of their life. Great plan there, society. So I, configured, I consider this logically. What do I want to do with my life back in the summer of the year 2000? Well, The Matrix was an awesome movie, so I figured that when I grow up, I want to do that for a living. You laugh, but I wasn't the only person I know whose thought processes worked this way. So I wound up I was going to double major in philosophy and computer science, because this makes me sound deep and awesome, at the University of Maine in a little town called Orono that nobody goes to on purpose. Obviously a top tier school if you want a degree in moose herding. And it turns out that it went really well for me, that college is a fantastic time. I met people doing interesting things, and I learned a lot of really cool stuff. But along the way, I forgot something, specifically show up. So I wind up getting an escalating series of letters over the next few semesters. Uh, take, the, take, the, take an escalating series of tones. Uh, you're no longer in the honors program. You're on academic probation. You're not admitted next semester. That's not our actual motto. motto. We don't offer a moose herding major. You know fully well it's our concentration of our wildlife containment major. Until it became increasingly clear that I didn't have a future in academia. So I joined the workforce. So now I need a job. 
And back to a talk I once gave on how to find a job, you don't put failures on your resume. And it's hard to talk this into a win. No degree is a very black and white thing. You can't put a positive spin on that in most cases. There's virtually no other professional failure you're going to run into that is this difficult to talk around when you're looking for a job. You didn't drop a $220 million weather satellite on the ground. You were helping to test its resistance to sudden lateral forces. <laughs> Oops, a doozy. So, as a result, for better or worse, my resume doesn't have an education section. Uh, this, remember, this isn't me choosing not to go to school, and it's not about me dropping out of school. This is me failing at it. And what makes this particularly painful was that I paid money to be a student. And you've told everyone on Facebook and your family, et cetera, that you're a college student. It forms a cornerstone of your identity, of who you are. And now instead of a college graduate, you're a college dropout at best. And even now, 15 years later, it's not the easiest thing in the world to talk about. I mean, I know a few intelligent people in this room who are also not college students who generally don't advertise it. Way to disprove that point by raising your hand. Yeah. So just for a minute, try to put yourself in my shoes and imagine what that feels like, uh, where it's not only something that I couldn't do well, it was something that I did so poorly that I was explicitly told not to come back. And I had to be able to admit to myself that somewhere along the way that I'd failed and reach out to a friend and ask for help. The way I got my first job out of school, a friend of mine lied, gave a really glowing positive reference. Not the best approach in the world, but it's how I got at, uh, forward. Which ties directly into my second failure, which I will explain the name of in just a minute. So I found myself working in a variety of different jobs over the course of my 20s. And some of them were easier to land than others. I, I, I kid you not, this line actually worked when I, when I gave it back to them. But no, but you have an awesome training program. When they say we're looking for a candidate with a degree and you're having that conversation in the interview, they've seen your resume already. They know you don't have the degree if you wind up in that circumstance. So you're right, I don't. But I learn quickly. I don't ask the same question twice. And you just finished talking about how awesome your training program is for new hires. I got the job. Turns out in hindsight, I also wasn't a great employee. <laughs> I had a giant chip on my shoulder and something to prove. Uh, pro tip, I'm not sure how it works in Israel, but in America, that's not exactly something that gets you forward. So when your boss invites you into a meeting unexpectedly and there's someone from HR sitting there and they don't offer you a cup of coffee, Close the door, have a seat, you're in for a wild ride. Your day is about to get really shitty. And studies have consistently shown that involuntary job loss is one of the five most stressful things that can happen to us as people. It ranks higher than a death in the family. Just a quick survival guide for anyone else who ever finds himself in a position like this. Stop, breathe. Go out to lunch or dinner with a friend, vent. Don't touch your resume that day. Tomorrow, it's still gonna be there. And take a breather for a second. Your resume will be updated tomorrow. Let's take a breather ourselves for a second and talk about three ways you can be terminated from a job in the abstract. This, this transcends country borders here. Uh, number one, the company has layoffs or goes out of business because Netflix ate their lunch. Uh, this sucks, you lost your job. Most employees aren't going to have, oh, for God's sake. Wackity schmackity do. Hey. <laughs> and we're back, cool. Yeah, most employees, when your company goes out of business, unless your name is on the front of the building, aren't gonna have a personal sense of failure tied to it. Our startup has reached the end of its incredible journey. You write a triumphant sounding blog post on Medium and you shut the thing off. Uh, too bad, so sad, life goes on. The second type of, of job loss comes from, for it's going to be terminated for cause. Uh, you stole a company car. You embezzled money. 
You literally stabbed a client on premises while wearing a clown suit and screaming. And then they were screaming. And then they stopped screaming. I mean, this one should be pretty easy to avoid. You got fired and you deserved it. Aspire to be smarter or at least not actively dangerous to your employer. But the third and most common in my experience is the, at least in tech, is you weren't a fit. And we're going to get to that asterisk in a minute. It's a culture issue. It was perhaps a performance issue. At least in where I live, you're still eligible to claim unemployment in this circumstance. This isn't for cause. It might come with a non-disclosure tied to it. It might come with a severance package. There's a lot of ways that this can play out. But this is the one that leaves you feeling crappy. And what's interesting about this type of job loss is I wanted to give it a name that was tied to someone prominent in the industry who'd been through it, like the Elon Musk circumstance, which is what I'm calling it in this case for no particular reason. But I couldn't find any well-known people who had gone through this situation themselves and been public about it. And this is fundamentally the problem because it's happened to more people that I know than it hasn't happened to. And rather than talking around, talking, and talking about this openly, we're instead sitting around silently ashamed that our type three firing looks more like a type two. Why do people react this way? It's a form of imposter syndrome where you feel like you've been faking everything. You've just been discovered as this giant fraud that you are. I just got fired. They're right. Someone finally figured out that I have absolutely no business working in this sector. Fortunately, there is a support group for this. It's called Everyone, and we gather on planet Earth. Mostly. <laughs> Please note that I'm not suggesting or implying Elon Musk has ever fired or, frankly, failed at anything, because for all we know, he hasn't. Eh? Part of what feeds into this destructive cycle that we have as a whole is a lack of empathy. Imagine that someone confides to you that they were fired. People, I can say this in personal experience, people go one of two ways when you tell them that story. I'm going to refer to them as the good response and the shitty response. The shitty version is, oh, you got fired. You must have been a terrible employee. This is common, curiously enough, among people who hail from Europe, where it's very difficult to, be, to lose your job unless you did something egregious. Much better of, of responses go is the nicer response, where people start telling you their own story. There are people that I look up to immensely in our sector, and when I told them my stories, they responded with, huh, let me tell you about a time that I got fired. And we'll have those conversations one-on-one, -on -one, but people don't go public about it. It is the healthier approach, and it helps you later in life as well. It makes you more of a human being when you have to fire someone or simply deliver criticism. Speaking of delivering criticism, let me tell you about a talk I've given at multiple conferences. It started off last year as an open space session here, where, let's talk about Docker for a second. I'll raise your hand if you've heard of Docker. <laughs> there we go. Raise your hand if you're still confused as shit about how it works. Yeah. I don't know how to run it. I don't know what it means entirely. And I had a hunch that maybe I wasn't the only person in the room that felt this way. Let's find out. So I built a talk about Docker around architecting a microservices environment, the works. And the entire theme of this talk when I gave it was, I don't get it. This is, let's use microservices, the best way I can think of to turn every outage into a murder mystery. Now tell me what I don't understand. I expected to be torn to pieces about it. And I wound up giving that talk at over a dozen conferences, including ContainerCon. And some people from Docker found out about this talk. I expected them to be waiting for me after the conference in the parking lot with some broken beer bottles and a baseball bat. And instead, we wound up having a really productive conversation that went both ways, that made my talk better, and in some ways started shaping the direction Docker started moving to address some of the concerns. Neither one of us in that situation could have done what we did in the same way without feedback from the other party. 
despite the fact that they didn't like me sandbagging on their product and I didn't like their approach to operations as a whole, we both came out ahead and we found some common ground. We looked past our basic assumptions and heard each other out. So as you go through your career, it's likely that you're going to be fired at some point or at least criticized heavily for something. It's going to be okay. Excellence is inherently situational. You can be a rock star in a job, leave, go somewhere else, and be fired for incompetence. And then your next job after that, you're a rock star again. Find the place where you're going to shine. It's not all companies. Which ties me a bit into my third failure story, uh, the failure of large numbers. So I'm looking at my annual salary, and I see it on offer letters, and I like it because it's a nice number. And then I see something that looks awfully similar to it again on my credit card bill because I was an idiot with credit. I had a few misconceptions about how it worked in the larger sense, and it starts to turn into something that changes your, your view of things. Because when you're many thousands of dollars in the hole, what's it matter if you just charge another $20 for drinks? You can always earn more money. And on a long enough timeline, this becomes the new normal. And you find that you can ignore it. I mean, you don't sleep well, but you can afford the payments. It took me years to get out of that rut, I guess, and it tended to dictate a lot of what I did. It was never the dollar figure itself. It was more about the psychology of it, where you can outspond any income. You can make a million a year, which doesn't help if you're, making a million, if you're spending more than a million. It makes lots of things harder in life. It's harder to qualify for a decent apartment, the kind you might want to live in, raise a family in, not get murdered in. Yeah. In the states and in industries in the United States where credit checks are allowed for employment, it's harder to get a new job that pays more. Now, how's that for irony? You're too broke to, earn a, to get a job that pays you more money so you can stop being broke. It's hard to get a decent car to take you to that job so you become unreliable. You're driving an unreliable 1992 Chrysler shitbox that you had to finance at 28% interest, and the hole gets deeper. I know, I'm sure there's at least one person who's a huge fan who's going to tell me the 92 shitboxes were completely underrated and they're great cars. Yeah. It, it's like being trapped under a couch. <laughs> and you think people are reluctant to talk about getting fired? Try talking to them about debt. 80% of Americans carry some form of debt today. The average credit card debt per household is $16,000. And nobody will talk to you about it, and everyone's sitting there in quiet despair themselves. It's, at least in American culture, a deeply personal thing. The only reason that I was able to talk with other people about theirs is because I started the conversation by talking about mine. So there are my three big failures. Uh, what ties them together, and what the hell makes this relevant for a DevOps conference? All three of these are embarrassing as shit. I still cringe now a little bit while telling these stories when I'm years past it, and it's hard. And I feel like a giant outsider every time I go through it because nobody talks about them, and they still don't. I still don't advertise these failures very often. Of course, now I'm doing it on video, which is going to be the best thing to play ever. So what's your greatest weakness in a job interview? Roll camera. Yeah. My mouth. Yeah. Ex all right. The things I say and the things I do. Other than that, I can't think of anything. Yeah. And, and even privately, when I tell these stories, I'm still spinning them slightly to make myself sound better than I am. And when this happens, you feel alone. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> Apparently, at least one more. So when this happens, you feel alone. And... We're still up? Good, good, good. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with you. The, these feelings are very common. I mean, I've been tossing around versions of this talk for two years before I finally put it together into this one. And when I was testing it out on a bunch of close friends, every single one of them told me at least one of these applied to them. So you're not alone, but you doesn't, people don't open up to this stuff until you open up to them about it first. And this is, of course, a fantastic and obvious lead-in to talking about software. 
we generally don't tend to write code face to face. Even in uh, places where we work, there's going to be remote employees and it becomes extremely difficult to remember the human. People become a screen name and just some text where it's very easy to dehumanize them. Um, for a quick example of how this can turn into something horrible, uh, find any woman in tech who tweets with any frequency and then go look at her mentions. Yeah, don't read the comments. This is why I love conferences like this one. It humanizes a bunch of screen names. Nobody is going to come here and tell me that they hate my code. Please go play in traffic somewhere. I have no business working in technology. Although this is Israel, so one tends to wonder about that. Yeah, right? But... And that's the point here, is that even if everyone's a stranger, you can meet people at conferences like this and have a chance to learn something new. Uh, one way that I like to do this is by asking the stupidest question I can come up with. And, but sometimes asking isn't enough. Uh, Git is simple and straightforward. Uh, I taught a class about it. Does anyone here not confused by Git? <laughs> oh, good. We, okay, a couple of hands here. There are liars. Good, I wondered. But I taught a class on this because I wanted to push my boundaries and get better at it. And people showed up for it who were way better at this stuff than I ever was to learn, not to make fun of me. I still marvel at that. Everyone is ignorant about all kinds of things. And people do have the ability to empathize. They, they do it all the time, even in Israel. It just takes someone making the first move and like asking a stupid question or walking up and introducing yourself to someone. I mean, look around. Everyone in this room knows something that is completely obvious to them because everyone else knows it. If you were to talk about it, you'd give people a holy shit moment. Everyone in this room has failed at something and felt like shit about it. I'm tempted to point out that the average human at any point has six pounds of shit inside of them, but unfortunately, you are literally full of shit is my talk coming up for Linux Fest Northwest, and they have the exclusive on it. So the next time you're in a talk and someone asks a dumb question that, with an obvious answer, duh, everyone knows the answer to that. But somehow other people are still taking an awful lot of notes around the answer that's given. So here's my ask. As you attend the rest of the conferences today, uh, and the rest of the talks today, ask a question that you're afraid might be dumb. Strive to sound like the dumbest person in the room. Because a funny thing happens. Uh, two funny things, really. First, you'll find that other people were wondering the same thing. And your dumb questions start to feel a lot less dumb very quickly. And people start looking to you for advice, to give talks. And before you know it, you're a thought leader. <laughs> Whatever the hell that is. I was too embarrassed to ask. <laughs> My name's Corey Quinn, and I'm a failure. If there are any questions, I'm willing to pass the chalice of thought leadership and others can feel free to ask. <laughs> no questions. No one was paying attention. Awesome. <laughs> hey. What is stigmata? Oh. Uh, <laughs> ask the internet. Yeah. No, so I hand in the back if someone does have a question. <laughs> yeah, shout it out. What is the thought leader? I'm still not clear on the concept, but it sounds like the most pretentious thing in the world, so it's right up my alley. <laughs> <laughs> Now, how do you get, the question was, how do you get yourself to ask the question that might be stupid? Yeah, um, yeah generally chemically uh, medicating your way into it, yeah, it works, but it has some side effects you don't like. Generally, it comes down, at least in my experience, to no longer giving a shit what people think about me based upon the question. And I found that once that happened, people thought of me in a more positive light. I was no longer the quiet guy in the corner. Not that I was too often accused of that one. <laughs> but it, it wound up, I guess... Building a sense of credibility where worst case, yeah, people may make fun of me and think I'm an idiot, but you know what? I'm going to have, after I ask that question, an answer. And sometimes the answer is, that's a great question. We don't know. Sometimes, wow, stupid questions do exist. So it, it depends. I mean, it's, I'm not going to say it's all sunshine and roses, but generally people are pretty positive. People don't tend to come to conferences like this if they're not willing to teach and learn at the same time. 
mean, the best aspect I've found here is not even in the talks. It's the hallway track where you ask people, I'm having this really obnoxious problem. And someone says, oh, yeah, I saw that six months ago. Here's how we solved it. Your current approach is going to burn four months. Let me save you some time. And then you come back and you have to justify to your boss about the uh, extortionate fee to attend the conference. Like, <laughs> you spent $30 to go to a conference? What value does it bring? Think about this for a second. It, yeah, and I've been on both sides of those conversations. I've saved people time, and I've had a lot of my own time saved. Thank you all for coming.